The social media website Twitter is now offering medical degrees for people who want to say they are doctors while they tweet their insane opinions in fits of uncontrollable rage. In order to receive a Twitter medical degree, you must be able to spell the word comorbidity correctly, give or take two or three letters, and you must be able to use the word herd immunity in a tone of voice that suggests you have the faintest idea what the hell you're talking about. In the final exam, you'll be asked to write a sentence that is provably untrue five times in a row in capital letters to indicate that it has now become true as a result of your doing that. The first graduating class included Dr. Bill Donald Trump lied People Die Jackson. Dr. People Die Jackson said, quote, It's obvious that anyone who wants America to return to work is a right-wing loon who cares more about some greedy shop clerk raking in the big bucks than he does about the innocent life of a grandma or a bunny or a little child with big sad eyes. As a medical professional, I'm telling you, if you leave your home, you risk dying of the virus or a car accident or maybe from cooking a burger in the office kitchen and having it spit hot fat in your eye, causing you to reel backward, slam into the wall, dislodge a supply shelf, which then buries you under a box of stationary supplies where you remain for days until you starve. Hashtag stay safe, stay home forever, unquote. Dr. Jane Tara Reed is telling the truth. Warkowski said, quote, I'm insanely outraged at this absurd, insane, outrageous absurdity. We must return to work now so that the tyrants stamping out our sacred liberties will be defeated. And also my roots are beginning to show, unquote. Twitter says their new medical degree will allow everyone on Twitter to speak about complex medical issues as an expert, just like they were doing before. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. I feel hunky dunky. Life is tickety boo. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky dunky dee dee. Ship shaped, tipsy topsy, the world is a bitty zing. It's a wonderful day, hurrah, hooray! It makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray! Oh, hooray, hurrah! So we all know there's a vertical division in this country dividing the left from the right. And it's always fun to talk about that because we're on the right and the left are tyrannical idiots. But there's another less edifying horizontal division that the Chinese flu has brought to light. That's the division between the whole and the broken. I was going to say between elites and non-elites, but that kind of flatters us by thinking if you don't own a yacht, you're off the hook. But really, if you've got any reasonable amount of money and power and self-reliance in your life, you have a lot of blessings you may be taking for granted. And there are other people who don't have what you have. Now, on the left, the people who talk most about inequality turn out to be exactly the people who seem to give not a single damn about those who live their lives without their kind of money and power. The left doesn't care if you're unemployed and in danger of being crushed by the tanking economy. They want to send you some government money and shut you up and keep the economy closed as long as it serves them. They sneer if you want to make an independent living. They sneer if you want Donald Trump to speak for you because you don't have a microphone and every network anchorman isn't your left wing patsy. They mock you when you want to enjoy the same freedoms of opinion, worship, speech, and self-protection that they have because their opinions are the accepted ones. So nobody tries to stop them. They don't worship anyone but their own reflections, and they live in safe neighborhoods and have people who carry guns for them. But there's a problem on the right as well. I've been arguing with my right-wing friends for a long time that we need to have more care for the poor as Americans and as Christians. It doesn't have to be government solutions, but it has to be better than, oh, my personal homogenous community works, so yours should too. We can't, can't always use statistics and patriotic rhetoric as a replacement for compassion. Yes, it's true. If you finish high school and get married and don't have children out of wedlock, you can escape poverty in America. But it's also true that if your dad is gone and your mom's on crack, you might not develop the discipline and wisdom you need to behave that way before it's too late. Likewise, right now, as some right-wingers march around shouting about liberty, mostly unnecessarily in my opinion, we might want to remember that a large percentage of the people dying of this Chinese flu are poor. Poor people have a lot of these so-called comorbidities like obesity, hypertension, heart disease, and diabetes. Because when you're poor, it's harder to eat well, and maybe satisfying some of your less healthy impulses adds some much-needed pleasure to a tough life. So while the all-is-well lefties need to understand that people on the edge need the economy to open so they can live independently and with dignity as free Americans, the all-is-well right needs to understand the precautions are still needed to keep the least among us as safe as it's possible to keep them. We can't just save the Claven, although that is urgent beyond my ability to describe. I can't tell you how important that is, but we also have to protect the poor. 
What it comes down to is that neither the left nor the right can find our way out of this maze without following the God of all. And he is the God of all, not just the left or the right, but he's especially the God of the broken. And we who are whole need to remember that. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff going on, especially the corruption that has been hidden by the virus. It's being exposed now, but the virus has taken up all the news and the Democrats are so happy about that. But first, let's talk about stamps.com. Obviously, if you need to go out and go to the post office right now, what you're thinking is, is no. I'm not doing that. But you don't have to because you've got stamps.com. It will bring you everything the post office can bring you right into your computer. Plus, you can actually save some money with discounts that you can't even get at the post office. Here at The Daily Wire, we've used stamps.com since 2017, which in American years is hundreds of years. We don't waste our time. It's great. Stamps.com brings all the services of the U.S. Postal Service right to your computer in the safety and comfort of your home, office, or anywhere else you're hunkering down right now. Whether you're a small business sending invoices or an online online seller shipping out products, or you're just working from home and need to mail stuff, stamps.com can handle it all with ease, any letter, any package, any class of mail, anywhere you want it to go. And you can get 40% off USPS shipping rates, uh, and you get great discounts, five cents off every first class stamp. Right now, my listeners get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale without any long-term commitment. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in, you guessed it, Clavin. That's Stamps.com. Enter Clavin. You can send away right now to find out how do you spell Clavin. Write me here. (laughs) Write me here, and I will sing that song into the phone or wherever uh, in your letter. Mailbag is tomorrow. you got to be a subscriber. If you do subscribe, (laughs) you will sound just like that. You'll also get two, not one, Leftist Tears Tumblr for your subscription. Uh, I will answer any question you got. Go to dailywire.com, click on the podcast button, click on the Andrew Clavin podcast, click that little mailbag symbol. You can ask me about religion. You can ask me about your personal life. You can ask me about politics. And all my answers are guaranteed 100% correct pretty good deal. They will change. My answers will change your life, possibly for the better, possibly. (laughs) All right. You know, by the way, on Wednesday, tomorrow too, I'm going to be doing the all access live. I am taking, uh, uh, Knowles and I are trading places. So if you're waiting for Knowles on Wednesday, he'll be on Thursday. I'll be on Wednesday. So don't call up asking me uh, your Catholic questions because I don't know. Uh, so president Trump, said he was sick of the press. He wasn't going to hold his briefings anymore. Then he said, I am holding my briefings. And he came back and he actually looked kind of refreshed. And, you know, he's been complaining about the press being unfair. I don't know why he thinks that. I mean, here's an example, a question from New York Magazine's Olivia Nuzzi. If an American president loses more Americans over the course of six weeks than died in the entirety of the Vietnam War, does he deserve to be reelected? So, yeah, we've lost a lot of people. But if you look at what original projections were 2.2 million we're probably heading to 60,000 70,000 it's far too many one person is too many for this we are fighting the fake news it's fake phony fake <laughs> trump doesn't take the bait it's like curses foiled again olivia news is like you know she then burst into a green uh, puff of smoke and vanished ari fleischer writes it's clown questions like this he tweets it's clown questions like this that can make the briefing a waste of time the only point of that question was to provoke not learn anything new not provide information to viewers the point was to get under trump's skin good to see potus Ro- Goes above and didn't take the bait. And Newsy's tweeted reply was, shut the F up. <laughs> it's like, and not only that, your daughter will prick her finger on a spindle and sleep for a hundred years. <laughs> this is the people. This is our press. And obviously we, we love them. We know them. You know, it is just, it is, they're so corrupt. And we've talked about the Biden thing proving how corrupt they are, but it does matter. And one of the things we're going to see is that it is a corruption that grows out of their connection to the Democrat Party, which has become corrupt because the Democrats and the press are one. It is all one big chain. So let's start with the new news about Michael Flynn, General Michael Flynn. Now, you know, this corruption stuff, sometimes I don't like to get into it because it's so difficult to follow and the, you know, the ins and outs are really hard. This is a very simple story. Michael Flynn is a heroic combat veteran, a uh, United States Army Lieutenant uh, General. He was the National Security Advisor when they, the FBI came after him and they questioned him about a phone call he had had with the Russian ambassador to the United States, Sergei Kislyak. Apparently, uh, um, Flynn had told Vice President Mike Pence that in, during this conversation, he had not talked about uh, 
the sanctions that the Obama administration had put on Russia because of their interference in the election. So but in fact, Flynn had said to Kislyak, uh, you know, we don't strike back because we're going to deal with this. Once we come into office, we're going to deal with this. So don't uh, strike strike back against us. Keep it cool. But he didn't remember this or he didn't want to tell Pence, whatever. He didn't tell him. So James Comey, FBI director, thinks that Trump has been colluding with Russia. So he's going to go in and find out about this and question this heroic combat general who's now the national security advisor. Remember, Trump has just come into office and he explained to Nicole Wallace how he went about doing this. You look at this White House now and it's hard to imagine two FBI agents ending up in the state room. How did that happen? I sent them. Um, um, Something we, I probably wouldn't have done or maybe gotten away with in a more organized investigation, a more organized administration, in the George W. Bush administration, for example, or the Obama administration. <laughs> the protocol, two men that all of us have perhaps increased appreciation for uh, over the last two years. <laughs> and in both of those administrations, there was process. And so if the FBI wanted to send agents into the White House itself to interview a senior official, you would work through the White House counsel and there'd be discussions and approvals and who would be there. And I thought it's early enough, let's just send a couple guys over. You're a lying dog face pony soldier. <laughs> well, he's, he's, you know, I think, unfortunately, I don't think, I think he's telling the truth. And it's shocking that an American audience would laugh at F- the FBI. These are the cops going in. They told Flynn, oh, you're not going to need a lawyer. It's just us, just guys, just friends. Then they went in and they questioned him without playing the tape of the conversation. They had the conversation on tape. Obviously, it was a uh, it was a recorded conversation. They didn't play it for him and they asked him questions about it. And they said it was friendly. Even the FBI agents who were there did not feel they were, he was lying. They felt he had forgotten what he was talking about. Andy McCarthy, who has been the absolute gold standard over at National Review discussing uh, these scandals. But, uh, you know, he really knows every detail about this. But he, as a former federal prosecutor, said that this in itself, the way this was handled, was suspicious. I've had many cases involving witnesses where you have a recorded conversation, as happened with General Flynn. If you're not trying to entrap someone or you're not trying to bring them into a perjury trap, what you simply do, especially I would think if you were dealing with a 33 year uh, heroic uh, combat veteran, a commander of the United States, what you would do is you bring him in, you play the tape and then you ask him, what did this mean? What did that mean? If you bring him in under circumstances where you have the tape and it doesn't need explanation and you're asking him what was said, I can't conceive of any reason to do that other than to hope that he'll get it wrong. And then you have a basis to say that he made false statements. I I just, you know, having done this a very long time, I, I, I can't wrap my brain around that. So that's exactly what they did. They set him up. They set him up to, to lie. So you got Comey saying, yeah, I sent a, guy, a couple of guys over there. We know that the FBI agents called him up in a friendly way. And, you know, the cops do this to people. But this is tremendous power being used against an administration that's just come into office. You heard Comey saying, well, we appreciate Bush and Obama. Now that snarky, nasty, sanctimonious way he has of driving Trump down and, and basically telling the 64 million uh, people who voted for him what idiots they are because James Comey knows so much more about it. Okay, so now they come and they say you lied to the FBI, which is a crime in and of itself. What he said to Kislyak, remember what he said to the Russian ambassador, not a crime. He didn't commit a crime on that phone call. Nothing he did in that phone call was criminal. It was only lying to the FBI or getting it wrong to the FBI because they set him up to do it. That was the problem. Right. And again, a combat hardened general of the of the United States Army, one of our heroes, they, they treated him like this is the way they treated him. They set him up to go down the drain. So now they come in and they start to twist his arm. And, you know, if you watch the I'm sure a lot of you watch Tiger King, you know, remember when the FBI comes in, you get scared. It's not you know, you're not Superman. Believe me, all those all the big talk you heard in that show, the Tiger King saying how what he was going to do and he's going to do this. The minute the FBI come in, it's like everybody collapsed, right? Because they have the power to put you in prison. It is not a good thing. And they have a lot of power. Just getting it wrong to them can be misconstrued as lying and can be a crime. I mean, they have tremendous power, which is why we're supposed to put tremendous restraints on them. And when you hear the press saying, 
oh, you're undermining our the credibility of our agencies to question the FBI. They are full of baloney and doing the opposite of their job. So now they twist his arm and they threaten to uh, get charge his son with a felony, to charge Flynn's son with a felony for failing to register with the Justice Department as a foreign agent, which is called a FARA violation, a Foreign Agent Registration Act. It's a crime that the DOJ almost never charged before the Mueller investigation kicked in because the Mueller investigation knew very, very quickly that the Russian collusion uh, theory was a hoax, right? So they went after people on process crimes because nobody wants to be appointed a special counsel and then deliver nothing, right? So Flynn pleads guilty. And in the plea agreement, which is often happens, they had a, a, a part where it said, we don't have to show exculpatory evidence, what's called Brady evidence. And the judge said, I'm not accepting that. You have to show the exculpatory evidence. So last Friday, in one of these Friday news dumps, they suddenly dumped this exculpatory evidence. We do not know exactly what is in this yet. We don't know exactly what the exculpatory evidence is, but Flynn's lawyer, Sidney Powell, says this is devastating and she wants him released from prison. General Flynn was innocent and was completely set up and framed by the upper echelon of the FBI, that small group of the highest ranking members of the FBI that deliberately set about from at least August 15, 2016 on to catch General Flynn in something and either prosecute him or get him fired. That's what we've alleged all so, along, and it's proving true with every new document disclosed. The disclosure of these documents and the advice that more are to come is going to help from all angles. It's the first step toward restoring integrity and credibility to the Department of Justice and the FBI to have this information exposed. The U.S. Attorney, uh, Assistant U.S. Attorney Joyce Lynn Ballantyne assigned to the case has advised us since Friday that they're working to re unredact or redact certain parts of the documents that were filed under seal on Friday so that they can be disclosed publicly either tomorrow or Wednesday. So this is, uh, you know, her, his lawyer. So obviously she's going to say this stuff. And I've been keeping off this case because I know there's a lot of sentiment for a, a general and a combat general and all this stuff. I know there's a lot of sentimental stuff going around. I wanted to make sure I have the facts, but this is appalling. And it feeds into Donald Trump's narrative. Uh-oh, uh-oh, Donald Trump's narrative once again turning out to be, for all his flaws, the true narrative when he says this should never have happened. I will only say this. I think that General Flynn is a wonderful man. He had a wonderful career. And it was a disgrace what happened to General Flynn. Let's see what happens now. But what happened to General Flynn should never happen again in our country. What happened to other people should never happen again in our country. What happened to your president of the United States should never again be allowed to happen. So this is this is all part of the corruption of the press, which is part of the corruption of the Democrat Party. We can tolerate the corruption of the Democratic Party because politics is corrupt. You know, you, you don't you expect your team to try to win. And sometimes your team will pull, you know, a deflated ball out there and maybe do a couple of scurvy things to win. We expect that from Republicans. We expect it from Democrats even more. But when the referee cheats, that's when you've lost the game. That's when the game is no longer the game. And that's what we have with the press. The press is supposed to be the referee. And now they're part of the Democrat Party. And that's the problem we have. Remember, remember, this was part of an investigation into something that didn't happen. Comey was gulled by Russian disinformation to believing that Trump had somehow colluded with Russians who somehow wanted Trump to win. The Russians couldn't have known Trump had any capability of winning. Everybody thought Hillary Clinton was going to win. They were just trying to start trouble as they do every election. Supporting Trump over supporting Hillary, they couldn't have cared less as long as it caused trouble. And with the Democrats' help, with the Democrats' help and the press's help, the Russians did exactly what they wanted to do. It's an appalling, appalling story. All right, let us take a quick break to talk about books. Books. What are books? Books are bouquets, and you want your mom is sheltering in place. Your poor mother is sheltering in place, and you're not even going to send her flowers. Oh, that's a terrible, terrible thing. Books are responsibly sourced bouquets from some of the world's finest eco-friendly farms, even farms on the sides of volcanoes, so flowers stay fresher longer. Did you know flowers and plants have been proven to reduce stress and boost productivity? I didn't know that, but now that we're spending more time at home, how about a little self-love to brighten your day and your space? Big savings means you can send farm flesh 
farm fresh flowers, plants, and gift bundles to all the moms in your life, your mom, a soon-to-be mom, your wife, your grandma, a dog mom, or treat your Self. Send smiles, no matter the miles, with books.com slash Clavin. That's B O U Q S dot com slash Clavin and enter code Clavin for 25% off your entire order. Again, that's code Clavin for 25% off at books.com slash Clavin. Who doesn't know how to spell books? I spell books every day. I'm constantly spelling books. How do you spell Clavin? That's the question. There are no easy All right. So moving on to more yet more Democrat corruption that is kind of hiding in this all the viruses stories because the virus is taking up all the news and all this corruption is now coming out because it's been uh, it's taken all this time to do it. We got to go back to our old friend, Uncle Joe Biden, Crazy Joe, Sleepy Joe Biden. You know, I, I was thinking today, Donald Trump said, if you're famous, a woman will let you grab her by the crotch. But it turns out if you're a famous Democrat, The New York Times, The Washington Post, ABC, NBC News and CNN will all let you grab her by the crotch because they are not going to cover this story. Two more sources. You remember yesterday we played the clip of Tara Reid's mother, the the woman who's accusing him, uh, accusing Biden of having uh, slammed her up against the wall and put her his fingers in her body, digitally raped her. I mean, that's basically what she accuses him of uh, in 1993. And we played a tape of Tara Reid's mother calling in uh, to Larry King's show on CNN to say that something bad had happened uh, with the the senator. Biden was then a senator. uh, And the fact that CNN basically buried the story. CNN didn't find the CNN footage. Uh, Our friends at Media Research Center found it and The Intercept uh, ran the story. Two more sources have come forward to corroborate certain details about Reed's claim. This is from Business Insider. One of them, a former neighbor of Reed's, has told Insider for the first time on the record that Reed disclosed details about the alleged assault to her in the mid-1990s. This is the quote. This happened, and I know it did because I remember talking about it. Linda Lacasse, who lived next door to Reed in the mid-1990s, told Insider. The other source, Lorraine Sanchez, who worked with Reed in the office of a California state senator in the mid-1990s, told Insider that she recalls Reed complaining at the time that her former boss in Washington, D.C. had sexually harassed her and that she had been fired after raising concerns. That's genuinely bad. You know, it's funny. I always think back on the Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas thing. The fact that Anita Hill was never fired, she was promoted, she was, you know, the, the accusations in that case were so minor that you would think the only thing you could say was that when she said something about it, she was fired, but she never was. She was promoted. She was really treated well. Business Insider sought access to Biden's senatorial papers, which are housed at the University of Delaware, to see if they could shine any additional light on Reed's claims. However, the university denied the request because we know the university is part of it. I just have to read you, just for laughs, I have to read you the Washington Post headline on this, okay? Here's the Washington. You had to listen to this carefully. This is like, this is almost a work of art. It's like Dadaist art, you know? (laughs) Developments in allegations against Biden amplify efforts to question his behavior. <laughs> Developments in allegations against Biden amplify efforts to question his behavior. I don't know what it means either, but it's some kind of version of Republicans pounce. I mean, that's going to be the story, Republicans pounce. But there are efforts to question his behavior. We're not making them. The Washington Post is making those efforts. And if we were making the efforts, we're not doing it. You know, tired. It's hard to get out. It's it's the lockdown. You know, I don't know. It's like I can't get him on the phone. We're making efforts, but uh, not that hard. And we're not questioning his behavior. But the efforts are amplified because the allegations are now being supported by more and more witnesses. And remember, again, hate to say it, but in the Kavanaugh case where we had to believe all women, where it was me too, you know, all this stuff. Just remember. No evidence. There was no evidence that Christine Blasey Ford had ever met Brett Kavanaugh. None. Okay, so this is a lot of evidence, corroborating evidence from the time. I'm not saying it happened. I'm only talking about the press so far. You know, like it's going to be very hard to get actual proof on this. But but this does lend plausibility to it. And if it's true that we have to believe all women and if it's true that the time time's up, time's up, as they say, you know, time's up for me, too. And me, too. And, you know, all this stuff. Why is this not a headline story? And, you know, I, you know, I, I can't wait for somebody to say, well, it's because of the virus. You know, we have to cover the virus. No, it's not. They're, they're actually covering this up. You know, Media Research Center, they've did, done such a good job on this and they're really a good site. They said the, the New York Times and Washington Post have published lengthy stories investigating the charges, although they did it like 19 days after the charges were made. ABC and NBC haven't spent 
even a single second on the story. CBS has devoted 63 seconds to it, while PBS gave it a mere seven minutes. The all-day news network CNN and MSNBC should have posted significantly higher totals, but they haven't. MSNBC managed only four and a half minutes all through April, in mid-April, while CNN only ended its complete blackout after we, MRC, posted their own video from 1993. It's just an it's just an amazing, amazing disparity. Also, of course, the tone of the feminist Alyssa Milano, uh, you know, she says she finally she finally she was burying this. I mean, she, Alyssa Milano is the TV actress who was a big, big Biden supporter. She tweets out, I'm aware of the new developments in Tara Reid's accusation against Joe Biden. I want Tara, like every other survivor, to have the space to be heard and seen without being used as fodder. I hear and see you, Tara. <laughs> Me too. Congratulations, Alyssa. You can hear and see. And she should have the space. She wants to have the space to be heard. Maybe a space, if, if it could be off to the side in a corner somewhere, maybe in a box, maybe with a curtain over it, that would be a good space where she could be heard. Another one is this uh, Michelle, oh, I forgot her name. Uh, Michelle Goldstein, is it uh, over at the New York Times, a former newspaper? She is the one who is a just a screaming feminist who went after the charges against Kavanaugh were absolutely dispositive. The fact that they existed were absolutely dispositive, dispositive that all men uh, were are pigs. It just was everybody. Everybody was indicted. Now she tweets, this is the most persuasive corroborating evidence that has come out so far. What a nightmare. Well, what a nightmare for whom? What a nightmare for Joe Biden. Why are we suddenly identifying with Joe Biden? Why wasn't it a nightmare for Brett Kavanaugh? You know, it, the, the thing about it is, it, again, again, it goes back to the press. It is about the, the fact that there are uh, that there are people on the left who are willing to support Joe Biden, as one Twitter person said, not a big Twitter person, but a person on Twitter said, I don't care if he raped 100 women at gunpoint, uh, we have to defeat Trump. Okay, you know, you're a partisan, I get it. You know, I, I think you're a jackass, but still, you know, you're a partisan, that's fine. It's the refs. You know, there used to be, you know, when I lived in England, all the papers there are partisan. They're all partisan. So, you know, when you get the Telegraph, it's a conservative paper. It used to be back then. Anyway, I don't know if it still is, but it's a conservative paper, independent, kind of moderate. Guardian is the leftist socialist paper. I would read them all. I would read the Telegraph as my daily paper, but then I'd pick up the independent and look at it. And then once a week or so, I'd get the Guardian and hear what the socialists had to say. And you knew exactly what you were getting. But because of the way the, the American press grew up, because of the standard of objectivity that actually became part of the American press in the 50s, when we had kind of a consensus in this country, the fact that that it has now deteriorated like this is just an amazing uh, example of corruption because it's not like the New York Times says we are the woke liberal paper. They say we play it right down the middle. They say it over and over again. No, no, we play it right down the middle. Dean Bacay had the temerity, had the courage, had the gall, I guess is the word, to come out and say, well, we're not covering this Joe Biden story because we're not covering this Joe Biden story. If we were covering it, then we'd cover it. But since we're not covering it, we're not covering it because it's not in the news. I know because I read my paper and it's not in the news, so we're not covering it. But if I read my paper and it was in the news, then I would cover it because it would be in the news because we'd be covering it. So I'd cover it. I mean, that's what, you know, that's what he came out and said. And nobody went to, no, there's nobody around him. There's nobody near to him. Say, Dean, you sound like a corrupt politician. You sound like a guy who's a bag man for the Queens Democrat Party. That's what you sound like. You sound like the most corrupt low life on earth. No, it's like, I'm Dean Bouquet. You know, I have my tie. I have my suit. Look, would I, could I be corrupt when I look like this, when I wear a suit like this? And everybody around him going, no, you're Dean Bacay. You must be a good fellow. You know, he's not. He's surrounded by all these people who agree with him. And so nobody is there to tell him that he sounds like a jackass. You know, Trump, again, has a fair gripe. He has this uh, line about the press. They were asking him about Joe Biden and how Biden was covered. And this is what Trump, Trump says. I can't tell you what's going to happen. We have a sleepy guy in a basement of a house that the press is giving a free pass to who doesn't want to do debates because of COVID and lots of things are happening, right? And I watched a couple of interviews and I say, oh, I look forward to this, but they're keeping him sheltered because of the coronavirus. And he's not moving around. He's not moving too much. And then I watch what the press does to the Republican party and to me in particular. We had the greatest economy ever put together. You know, th this is the thing. When the Democrats and the press are one, and they are, when there's corruption in the Democrat Party, there's corruption in the press. 
When there's corruption in the press, there's corruption in the narrative. When there's corruption in the narrative, in order to pre- uh, preserve the narrative, the dishonest narrative, you have to silence people, you have to censor people, you have to stomp on people. And that's what's happening on YouTube. That's what's happening on Twitter. That's what's happening in social media. It's what's happening in the press. They're, they now hate free speech. Why? Because they have become corrupt by attaching themselves to the Democratic Party, which is inherently corrupt because it's a political organization. Political organizations get corrupt. It's a bad situation. All right. Let us take a moment to look at honey. Well, I was using honey yesterday. I can't even remember what I was buying, but I was buying something online and the honey pops up with all these coupons that saved me a lot of money. And it's really easy. It takes a few minutes to put honey onto your computer. It works in the background. And when you go shopping, it looks for coupons and deals that you can get. And obviously you're sitting home by now, you're probably ordering things like, you know, 18th century hats for elephants or something because you just want to get something. Honey will find, there's a deal, Honey will automatically find the best promo codes and apply them to your cart. So when you check out, the little box drops down. All you have to do is click apply coupons. You wait a few seconds for it to scan for every promo code on the internet and you watch the prices drop. Honey has found it's over 18 million members, over $2 billion in savings. So if you're not using Honey, it's literally passing up free money. It's free to use and installs in just a few seconds. Plus, it's backed by PayPal, so you know it's good. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash Andrew. That's joinhoney.com slash Andrew. It really does work. All right. Remember, tomorrow is the mailbag. You will want to be there for that because all your problems will be solved for the price of a membership, all access member or insider plus member. You will get two of these two solid gold diamond encrusted leftist tears tumblers, which are different from all other solid gold diamond encrusted tumblers because they are not solid gold and diamond encrusted. You'll get two of those. You'll get uh, three hours of Ben show. You'll get op-eds, special op-eds from Ben. Uh, you'll get a web, a, an ad-free website. You get to use the mobile app and you get to be in the mailbag. And you on Wednesday, you can also talk to me at five o'clock Pacific, uh, eight o'clock Eastern, right? On the all access show, you get a lot of stuff. And we solve all your problems. So come on over to dailywire.com and subscribe. You know, the the other, the final thing about the the press is, I I, I know I say this a lot, but it's important to remember that the press doesn't work on each individual lie. It works on an atmosphere. And you live in that atmosphere. And that's the atmosphere that, that's what they call the narrative. And it is amazing. It is amazing how powerful a narrative is. I know people who believe that it is good to believe in God. I know people who say, the same people, they'll say it's, it's good to believe in God. Our nation was founded uh, on New Testament principles. I know that Christianity is good. I live by Christian principles. I think we should all live by Christian principles, but I can't believe in Christianity. And almost every time when you think about it, it's not logic. It's not science. They can't, you say, well, what science disproves Christianity? It's not that. It's that a, a sort of atmosphere, an atmosphere that makes you feel that this stuff can't happen. And when you start to examine it, that narrative falls apart and you think like, oh, you know what? This, this actually could have happened. Maybe not everything happened, but it, a lot of this could have happened. The important stuff could have happened. And so that narrative is just amazingly powerful that my, my, the exa- my go-to example is George Washington, a hero of liberty, uh, a guy who gave away a kingship. He gave away the possibility of being king of an entire continent. And if you don't think that's a hard thing to do, it's only because you and I have never had that chance. But if you have that chance, it's a very hard thing to walk away from being king of an entire continent. He did it because he loved liberty, but he couldn't understand why his slaves would escape. It took him a lifetime. It took him his whole lifetime just to figure it out because the narrative was so powerful. The economic exigencies and uh, needs that he had were so powerful because the narrative is part of a web in your, uh, a web that holds together your society. It is hard to break through. People ask me, one of the questions I get asked all the time is, how can I convince so-and-so of so-and-so? How can I convince X of Y? And I always say, you probably can't because you're not just asking them to change their mind. You're asking them to break out of a web of relationships. Uh, maybe their mother and father and grandmother and grandfather were all Democrats. And you're asking them to say, oh, the Democrats are wrong. And you're thinking, but I've proved it to you. But you're asking, it doesn't matter because you're asking them to tear themselves out of that narrative, which is part of an incredible web of information. So, One of the things that's happening now as we try to reopen in this time of plague, right, is that a tone is being set, or at least they're trying very hard to set a tone about uh, 
about not reopening, about fear, about terror. And there's plenty of reason for fear. You know, I'm not, I'm not telling, I've told you a million times, I think we should be cautious. I don't think we should go storming the barricades and some idea for some principle of liberty that's actually not under threat. You know, people say to me, well, liberty is under threat because there's a slippery slope. I agree with that. There is a slippery slope. We know the Democrats can now declare a thumbnail, uh, a hangnail, uh, an emergency and shut down our freedoms. We know that they will. Tr- we know they'll try to do that. If there's a slippery slope, the Democrats will bring the grease. There's no question about it. We know they'll do that. But it's not an issue right now. That's something we're going to have to deal with when it comes, because this is or was a legitimate health emergency. It's time to reopen. Now it's a legitimate economic emergency. Listen to the difference. Listen to uh, Trump talking about this. This is a cut 15. We also stand in solidarity with the thousands of Americans who are ill and waging a brave fight against the virus. We're doing everything in our power to heal the sick and to gradually reopen our nation and to safely get our people back to work. They want to get back to work and they want to get back to work soon. There's a hunger for getting our country back and it's happening and it's happening faster than people would think. You know, and that's that's a that is a really upbeat, uh, good tone. He's saying gradually, he's saying cautiously, he's saying all that, but he's saying it has to happen. Whereas if you go to the New York Times, a former newspaper, every story is a story of fear. Every story is states try to reopen while death lurks outside the door. I mean, that is really if you look at you can look it up online. Just look at the front page of the New York Times. Every single story is evil. Trump wants money to flow into the coffers of human beings, but. They're all going to be dead. You know, that's basically the news. And that tone, that tone of fear, that tone of of everything that Trump does is a failure. Everything that Trump says is a scandal. Every tie that he wears is a slap in the face to the American way. You know, it, it, it is it is what the press does. It's what they do for a living. And, you know, when you listen to, uh, I don't know, like Garcetti, who I think is a terrible mayor. He's the mayor here in L.A. Uh, here's here's his comment. My sense is probably in the next two to six weeks, we'll see some baby steps forward. You know, it's so critical to have a few things in place. It's not really about a date or how few cases you have. It's about the infrastructure you have to handle opening up. Um, So the good news is the bad news here. The good news is, and thank you to everybody listening, what we've been doing has worked. It has saved thousands of lives. Um, But the bad news is that means, according to the USC prevalence study, we have about 96% of us that could still get this. And if we opened up the wrong way, we could have by August 1st, 95 percent of us with COVID-19. But that's just not true. I mean, all the science is against that. Basically, uh, the, the idea, remember, that's goalpost moving. The idea is that we were supposed to shut down to keep the hospitals from getting overwhelmed. That has only happened in one or two places. I doubt it's going to happen uh, here. So it's and it really and the and the hospitals are in trouble. The hospitals are closing because they don't have their beds are all empty and they don't have uh, any money. They don't have services. Uh, so they don't have people paying. The, the other thing about this is this constant. Um, This constant attacks on Donald Trump have obscured the fact that he was right about China and that China is a serious, serious problem going forward. I mean, we're going to have to, you know, Politico did this thing. uh, Unbelievable. Politico issues a a story correcting a story that they wrote about China and Trump uh, owing tens of millions of dollars to the Bank of China. This has been a big mainstream media thing that, oh, Trump says China, but he has dealings with China. OK, so here's Politico writing about themselves. Politico published an article Friday morning on President Donald Trump's business dealings with China. Uh, it was called Trump owes tens of millions to the Bank of China and the loan is due, due soon. Since then, new reporting and information have led us to update and correct the article after publication. And you know, you I don't have to tell you, it means when they correct that, that just means it's not true, right? It's not true. On Friday evening, Politico received a statement from a representative for Bank of China USA, which had not been contacted acted beforehand that the bank had sold off or securitized its debt shortly after the 2012 deal. A spokeswoman said the bank has no current financial interest in any Trump organization properties. Now, the key term there is the Bank of China, which had not been contacted beforehand. <sighs> it's just, like I said, if you were at preschool and preschool had a preschool journalism class, they would say if you're doing a story about the president of the United States debts to the Bank of China, one phone call you want to make kids is to the Bank of China. But they didn't even contact them. And so, you know, 
the fact that Trump, the, the, the idea that globalism is now appearing to be as bad as Trump said it is, is just intolerable to these globalist elites. And here's, here's Bill G- Gates talking about what happened in China. Well, I don't think that's a timely thing because it doesn't affect how we act today. Uh, you know, China did a lot of things right. You know, at the beginning, like any country where a virus first shows up, you know, they can look back and say where they, they missed some things. Uh, you know, a lo- uh, the, there, you know, some countries did respond very quickly and get their testing in place and they avoided the incredible economic pain. And it's sad that even the U.S. that you would have expected to do this well uh, did it particularly poorly. But it's not time to talk about that. But this is the time to take the great science we have, the fact that we're in this together, uh, you know, fix testing, treatments, and get that vaccine, and, you know, minimize the trillions of dollars uh, and many things that you can't even dimensionalize in economic terms uh, that are awful about the situation that we're in. You were too smart to be acting this dumb. <laughs> well, that was a really cheesy thing to say. That was a really cheesy, sneaky thing to say. What he said was, it's not time to talk about the fact that China did such a great job. And it's not time to talk about the fact that America did a terrible job. China didn't do a great job. China let this thing spread while lying to us. And where is the story about Microsoft's incredible, incredible web of dealings with the Chinese. I mean, this is the thing. Everybody who's covering this, everybody who's talking about it, all of these people have dealings with China that are so powerful, that are so uh, interlinked, that nothing they say is trustworthy. Nothing Bill Gates says about China is, is trustworthy. They went into, Microsoft went into China and helped them build their economy and is now interwoven with them forever. And was that the next question? Of course not, because that's not part of the narrative they're trying to create. This is an amazing, amazing moment in our history because of the power of the media and because of the widespread corruption in the media, including social media. And it is a, a moment of of the, like I said yesterday, the matrix, matrix taking over reality. We're still here. We're still talking here at the Daily Wire. And it's going to be really fascinating to see how powerful reality is because reality does have a voice. And sometimes, sometimes the truth can overcome lies if God wills it. All right. A final reflection. I got to talk about, I've been trying to talk about this, this Harvard article by a woman named Elizabeth uh, Bartholet. Uh, the Wasserstein Public Interest Professor of Law and Faculty Director of the Law School's Child Advocacy Program. And she is attacking homeschooling. And she says it's authoritarian for parents to be able to school their own children without the state supervising it. That's authoritarian. (laughs) She says we have an essentially unregulated regime in the area of homeschooling, right? So all 50 states have laws that make education compulsory and state constitutions ensure a right to education. But she says, if you look at the legal regime governing homeschooling, there are very few requirements that parents do anything. That's not true, actually. They do have to meet certain uh, standards. But she says, effectively, people can homeschool who've never gone to school themselves, who can't, who don't read or write themselves. And of course, the big problem is they're Christians. So many of these people are Christians who don't want their kids educated by an atheist state to tell them that there are 57 gen- genders and all this nonsense. And she calls them extreme religious ideologues. And I just have to answer this by saying, you know, I, I never knew a lot of people who were homeschooled uh, growing up, and I didn't know a lot of uh, people who were homeschooled before I got to know a lot of evangelical Christians. So she's right. A lot of these people are evangelical Christians. And one of the things I have been so struck by is how many of them are sane, happy, educated people, well-educated people, open-minded people. When I was teaching at Hillsdale last year, one of the really fun experiences in my life, something I just really enjoyed, I taught a seminar on how, as it was for the journalism department, I taught a seminar on how to cover the media, how journalists should cover, uh, how journalists should cover the culture, I'm sorry, how they should cover the culture. And one of them was on covering issues of sex, issues of sexuality. And I'm in a room, I don't know, 15, 20 kids, and they're mostly homeschooled. Most of them are homeschooled. And they're very bright, and they're well-educated, and they're uh, nice people, and they seem sane people, at least as far as I could tell. And I asked the question, you know, is there such a thing as masculinity and femininity? Is there such a thing as manhood 
and womanhood. Uh, and we had a discussion about it. And a lot of the girls were more doubtful about this than the guys. The guys said, yes, there is. There is something. And But a lot of the girls were no. There were, and we started to have a conversation about it. And we started to kind of, you know, I won't say we came to a consensus where we all agreed, but we started to kind of move toward a place, not by my engineering, it, just by the conversation doing going what it, the way it went. Well, we started to think like, yeah, there are feminine and masculine traits, but some people, of course, are outside, uh, are outliers. And also, uh, you know, there is encouragement from some of these traits by society. And, you know, there's a, a mixture of things. It was a really intelligent conversation. It wasn't until hours later, may have been days later, when I suddenly occurred to me that if I had brought that up at Harvard, if I had brought that up at Yale, I might have lost my job. I might have been thrown out. I might have been condemned. I might have started a riot, you know. Because they're closed-minded, because they're small-minded, because they're taught by leftists, and leftism is is an open enemy of truth. It always has been. Uh, leftism has always been an open enemy of the idea of objective truth. And those of us who believe in objective truth know that objective truth doesn't come on a, a license plate, on, on a bumper sticker. It comes through conversation as you move by half measures toward a truth that's always a little out of reach, but is in fact there. These homeschooling kids are much more uh, open. They're much more, they're just by my observation, much more free thinking, uh, much more civilized and much more sane than the people who go to public schools uh, and get drugged if they're not polite, if they're not, if they're boys, uh, they get set, they get given sedatives, they get taught nonsense that the left seems to think is true about gender and about uh, sexuality that they don't even need to get from uh, school. They can learn that uh, from their parents and learn it on their own. Uh, this is this this tyranny uh, going on at Harvard. Yesterday, I read a piece saying that uh, big business should surveil us and censor us the way they do in China. And China has been right to do this. Uh, the Chinese government has been right to do it. And the American government has been wrong. What the hell is going on at Harvard? It is really time to take a look at this incredibly, incredibly wealthy school uh, that is schooling people and saying it's still Harvard. Because in the same way the New York Times is a former newspaper, it's possible, just judging by these examples, that Harvard may be a former university, just like the press is a former press. All right, the mailbag is tomorrow. That means enjoy your problems today because tomorrow they will be over. But you got to subscribe at dailywire.com. Be here tomorrow. I'm Andrew Claven. This is The Andrew Claven Show. The Andrew Claven Show is produced by Robert Sterling and directed by Mike Joyner. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Technical producer, Austin Stevens. And our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. Assistant director, Pavel Wydowski. Edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio mixed by Robin Fenderson. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. Animations are by Cynthia Angulo. Production assistants, McKenna Waters and Ryan Love. The Andrew Claven Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2020. If you prefer facts over feelings, aren't offended by the brutal truth, and you can still laugh at the insanity filling our national news cycle, well, tune in to The Ben Shapiro Show. We'll get a whole lot of that and much more. See you there.